going to talk today about factor investing and specifically factor investing in fixed income. Um, factor investing, or what it's more commonly known to many investors is smart beta, has really taken the industry by storm and has seen step change growth over the last uh, primarily three to four years. Uh, but it's certainly, I'm fond of saying in front of groups that it's that smart beta and factor investing is not new, but it is new to most investors. Historically, it's been the purview almost exclusively of large institutions and professional investors as to the efficacy, since the efficacy of the, when they were first documented, uh, you know, over three decades ago. Uh, and it's really taken by storm, but that has mostly been in the equity markets. Um, and mostly through, or particularly in the last couple of years, through smart beta ETFs. It really hasn't penetrated to a great degree fixed income. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that today and what that looks like to find that. But a lot of what's driving that is te technological innovation, uh, access to the data, uh, access to tools, and the democratization of access much widely to all investors through smart beta ETFs. Uh, has really been the core of why it's grown so much. And, and we think it's only going to continue for a while. So let me frame a little bit of where it lives in the sphere, at least smart beta uh, investing lives in the sphere of, of indexing overall. And specifically, I'll talk about fixed income indexing today. So obviously, the large majority of indexing today uh, on both the equity and the fixed income side is primarily in what people are familiar with as market cap weighted indices or indices and portfolios that follow them that reflect the market. Uh, the bigger the company, the bigger the weight in, you know, exact pro rata to their penetration in the marketplace. Smart beta falls on the sort of other side, the, the faster growing but much smaller side of the category of what we call alternative indexing. There's two forms of that. One is smart beta, which I'm going to get into a little bit more directly. Um, and then the other form of that is alternative weighted indexing that isn't based on you know, capitalization size, but intentionally deviates from the market to achieve some other goal, either vol, you know, vol risk parity strategies or GDP weighted strategies or the like. Smart beta is really about waiting on the basis of factors. And that's what I'll go into a little bit more deeply and then talk about its uh, utilization in fixed income. So this is how we you know, divide the world of BlackRock, although broadly among quantitative investors and academics, uh, there's pretty much consensus on two types of factors. Uh, and, and not you know, wholly unfamiliar to us, it's just never really been packaged until recently as smart beta or factor investing. So there's macro factors, those that primarily drive the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of returns in any product, in any portfolio. They cut across all asset classes. They pervade all investment portfolios. It's just a matter of degree in which they play out. On the macro side, it's you know, familiar. In the fixed income world, on the macro side, it's rates, it's credit, it's inflation. Style factors refers to what defines characteristics that differentiate performance within asset classes, and specifically, what are those security characteristics that drive performance within asset classes? And these have been documented to show that they have long-run premium to the market. Momentum, volatile or low volatility. Value investing and size everyone's known about for generations. Those are factors, but there's other factors that are coming to bear and that have been documented for decades in quantitative circles and academic circles, but have not been widely available. So the obvious question is, so why, what drives these premiums I'm referring to? How come these things uh, have outperformed the market? Well, there's primary three drivers of why they have outperformed as a factor or characteristic major. One is just rewarded risk. This is more familiar to those value and, and uh, small cap investors that have been going on for generations. Some stocks are just riskier, and therefore the market demands a premium, either because their businesses are undiversified, 
They're subject to high fixed costs and therefore uh, suffer more in downturns, or they're limited uh, as to how much credit they can access, particularly in diff difficult economic times, obviously smaller companies. But there's two other drivers that are critical to why, they, why these premiums exist in the marketplace and, and how they've been found for decades by academics. The second bucket is structural impediments in the marketplace. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the reality that the vast majority of investors are leverage constrained and cannot short. That causes them to gravitate to certain stocks, to bid up certain types of investments, uh, and cause others to be undervalued relative to their potential return. And then the third and the major bucket that defines a lot uh, of this premium that has been documented by behavioralists for a long time and is now coming more to bear as folks like Richard Thaler and, uh, and others, Kahneman and others rise to prominence. And that is just behavioral biases that we all share in investing. The most notable one, but there are many, is the concept of the lottery effect. That the vast majority of investors gravitate to investments, particularly in the equity markets. And there's a, uh, well, particularly in the equity markets and the lottery effect. They gravitate to stocks with higher volatility. Stocks that they think are more likely to treat doubles, triples, and, and systematically drive up their prices. Uh, conversely, they tend to ignore low volatility or low beta stocks because they're the possibility and more importantly, the probability of outperforming is low. And the vast majority of money, as we all know, is still managed to outperform. There's other biases, the hurting effect, which drives a lot of momentum, recency bias, the, the tendency for investors to extrapolate noise out into the future. These are the fundamental drivers of why there's biases to some stocks driving their prices up relative to their reasonable expected return and conversely ignoring stocks uh, on that same plane. So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few moments, but these are the things that are driving the, the incredible interest in factor investing uh, today and it's just uh, you know just expanding dramatically, but most of that is accrued to the equity side of the equation, and these factors and these understanding of these factors are becoming more widespread. We think it's going to fundamentally change the business. We think it already has. We're seeing uh, very different approaches to benchmarking within our institutional business as a result of understanding of this. And here's just one simple example. Uh, mo one of the most simplest examples in fixed income that is now becoming widely aware of. So for, I think most investors have understood, unlike um, in the equity markets, the standard bear of benchmarks in fixed income, the Barclays Ag, has been an easy bogey for active investors and been increasingly an easy bogey over the last decade. Why is that? Why, why do fixed income investors so easily outperform the Barclays Ag, yet struggle so much on the equity side of the equation? Well, that's because the benchmark doesn't actually represent the aggregate investment universe. And, and specifically, it doesn't represent the characteristics of the average fixed income investor. We all know the Barclays Ag has become largely because of debt financing by the government and the massive expansion of the mortgage market, 75% government guaranteed issuance in some way or another, either through treasuries or mortgages. Yet the average active manager in fixed income just systematically overweights credit, particularly high yield credit. And so they have just captured that easy premium what we call a static factor premium, and have outperformed. When you look at it, and the right side of this, the left side of the slide has the breakdown of the Barclays Ag relative to the average intermediate term bond manager. The right side shows the rolling outperformance of the average active manager in the intermediate space against the performance of the high yield market. See a pretty high correlation there, right? High yield does well, 
active managers do well. High yield's not even in the Barclays Ag, yet the average holding from the average active manager in the intermediate term bond mutual fund space is on the order of 10%. They also overweight IG credit. This factor exposure is actually what's driving the excess return. It's not a tremendous amount of insight, aggregately at least, from the result of active managers. And in fact, when you benchmark them against a benchmark that more looks like the average active manager, namely the Barclays Universal Index, which includes all dollar-denominated debt, including a high yield and investment grade, it outperforms the average active manager. And we know that has to be the case. Sharp's arithmetic of alpha told us long ago that the average active manager cannot outperform. Anything that shows you that has to be a comparison problem. And in this case, they're just, they're just capturing the credit factor. So we think, uh, it's good, and we're already seeing today, it's gonna fundamentally change our business. We believe alpha will be redefined in this context. And we're already seeing it from many of our institutional investors at BlackRock today. They are now investing largely on the base of factors by capturing those factors in rules-based, very cheap, efficient ETFs and other sort of rules-based indexing portfolios. And they're now focused on active managers, and we still believe in alpha at BlackRock, but institutional investors and now retail investors are more focused on active managers that can demonstrate excess return over and above these factor exposures, namely security selection and timing decisions, whether they be factor timing decisions, which they can be timed, or any other kind of timing decision, subsectors, uh, et cetera. And it's fundamentally, ch fundamentally changing the balance uh, in our business, and we think that's going to only accelerate from here. So I've talked a little bit about style, about macro factors, about style factors, um, and a lot of strategies today are now focusing on how to combine them um, to, to deliver a superior risk-reward framework for, for shareholders. And we're seeing benchmarks quickly changing um, uh, across our business. I'm just going to dive one step deeper uh, on the fixed income side to make this point. Uh, as crystal clear as possible by, by looking at the strategies specifically that are being generated on the fixed income side to capture. And I'm going to focus on one of the more familiar concepts on the equity side of the factor world, the concept of the low vol, what is commonly called in the academic journals is the low vol anomaly. And that is that low beta stocks in aggregate over the long term have returned roughly what high beta stocks have returned. That flies in the face of everything we learned in Finance 101 and the capital asset, capital asset pricing model, which says higher risk should be rewarded with commensurate higher return. That there should be roughly a linear relationship between that two. What this slide shows is the theoretical security market line, the dark line um, going more you know, diagonally upward and then the actual empirical market line, which you see is almost flat. On a classic risk return spectrum, that indicates that despite higher risk, as you go to, to the east uh, on, on this line, despite higher risk, returns do not rise, commensurately at least. They rise barely at all. Um, and, and so, you know, and so the, the reasons why that, why that is primarily are believed that, uh, going back to what I said earlier, is structural impediments. Most in, money is still managed to outperform. Most investors cannot short or use leverage. As a result, they gravitate their higher volatility stocks, trying to increase the possibility, but not the probability, as this line shows, of outperforming. They systematically ignore lower beta stocks. So if you ran, um, uh, and we, we did this very recently, if you looked at the totality of the active equity mutual fund universe and uh, ran the, all of the holdings 
of that active space through a factor model. You see that they are underweight low volatility stocks by about $600 billion in roughly a $4 trillion market. And obviously they are commensurately overweight high volatility stocks. There's also the concept of lottery effect, which I mentioned earlier, is that just behaviorally, people aren't particularly interested in low, low beta stocks. And as a result, again, they ignore them, their prices are lower relative to their uh, expected return and high, and high beta stocks commensurately the other way. So high beta has uh, returned roughly as much as low beta, but with considerably more risk. The same concept plays out, not as pronounced for obvious reasons, in the corporate bond space. We commonly refer to it, and it's referred to a lot of the industry papers as the concept of reach for yield. And that is investors within all uh, sub-credit classes, sub-quality, tend to just gravitate systematically to the higher yielding bonds. And again, ignore uh, the lower building, not, not completely, but systematically demand higher yielding bonds, pushing up their prices, pushing down their yields relative to what their risk is. Um, and so we see deviations in the corporate bond market also from the theoretical uh, security market line. This next slide captures a little bit more precisely. So what this shows is overlays sharp ratios against a simple quintile breakdown uh, based on yields. As you see, you see, and so we had the returns, the yields and returns in the bars over the last 20 years. And then the line shows the sharp ratio by quintiles. So you see what you would expect in the bars, a rising uh, return as a result across those quintiles of yield. But not as, as, as high as it otherwise should be based on the risk equation. And you see that demonstrated by the sharp ratio declining uh, as you go farther out that. And there's an opportunity to exploit this bias that exists in the marketplace. Um, and one simple way is you know, a common strategy in the marketplace. We use it in our hedge funds as well as our, just our model-based active quant and now make it available in index construction. So what this shows is the, the U.S. corporate bond market in the center line is the uh, return and volatility or its, and its combined sharp ratio across the middle of roughly 0.74. This reflects all bonds uh, and the returns in, ex in excess return um, terms. A simple quality overway biasing away from the highest yielding bonds can result in a superior sharp ratio as, as demonstrated by the line below that. But for many investors, this wouldn't be particularly attractive. Uh, while it has a superior sharp ratio, it does have a lower yield, obviously commensurately significantly less volatility, but it may not be attractive in that regard because it is still lower yielding at the end of the day. And for those that have the, the, the uh, certain benchmarks to meet, certain yield, income needs to beat, uh, needs to defease certain liabilities, that still might not be an attractive equation, even if it has a superior sharp ratio. You can tilt then away from that, so after doing a quality overlay, based primarily on balance sheet strength um, merits, and add a value tilt which basically looks at the compensation to default risk and bring that, both that yield at the expense of additional volatility, but at a better trade-off against the broader market to increase to the line that's at the top, the sharp ratio of 0.88. This is a simple demonstration of how these are commonly exploited. These biases are exploited in quantitative circles within, uh, within the active fixed income camp. So I'll stop there. I obviously covered this at a very, very high level. But the, the salient points for us, or for me, and that I offer to you are this. And that is that increasingly investors are discovering 
that was, was once understood as alpha, meaning any return in excess of the market, is largely been driven by harvesting factor premiums. And it's causing a re-benchmarking in this industry across all asset classes in terms of how active managers should be judged. We, we believe it's gonna fundamentally change the definition of alpha from what is today still largely any return in excess of the market to that of return in excess of factor exposures, meaning specifically timing decisions and security selection decisions. And we think it's gonna drive a lot of the interest in this industry going forward. It's certainly driving a lot of the ETF industry and indexing broadly. Thanks for your time.